Hi, welcome back to this Intro to Seaborn series. Today's video is going to be fire because we're talking about the Seaborn heat map. Just to give you a little preview of what's coming up in this video, I'll start out with the basics of the heat map, including what a heat map is, as well as how you can build one using Seaborn. I'll also introduce you to one of the most popular types of heat maps for displaying the correlation among your variables. Next, we'll move on to color palette choices, which are super important when building an effective heat map, as well as how to annotate your heat maps directly. Then we'll move on to some additional styling, including how to change your X and Y tick labels. So with that said, let's dive in. To motivate the use of a heat map, let's say that you own a cafe and you track the average number of each beverage you sell on each workday. With tabular data like these, it can be really difficult to notice that coffee is your best seller on Wednesdays or that soda is your worst seller. In a heat map, you're just going to map each value to a particular color so that you can find these insights much quicker and so that you can communicate your results to others. So let's go ahead and look at that Seaborn code. I'm going to start by importing the Seaborn library as well as PyPlot and NumPy. And I'll load in some data from Seaborn. And these data are about cars, so each row gives the statistics about a specific car. Before building our heat map, let's go ahead and group up some of that data. So I'm going to group by origin or region where each car was made, and then also take a look at the number of cylinders of each car. So I'm just doing a value count here. So I know that there were 63 different cars with four cylinders from Europe, etc. And you'll see that these data right now have this multi-level index. So what we can do to actually tidy this up is go ahead and unstack our data. Once we do that, we get back into tidy format so we know how many cars were produced in each region with each number of cylinders. You'll see that this process has created a few different null values here, and in this case, we can be quite sure that these null values were just created because we didn't have any cars from this region with that specific cylinder type. So let's go ahead and fill those missing values with zeros. It turns out that Seaborn's heat map will accept missing values, but we would end up with blank squares. So to avoid that, we're just filling with zeros here. All right, so let's go ahead and save that data and we're ready to build our very first heat map. In order to build a heat map within Seaborn, you just need to reference the Seaborn library and call it the heat map. And now you can pass in this data frame directly. And there we go. So you'll see that however your data was structured, um, you'll see the different um, rows here as well as columns here. And we've mapped each of those values to a specific color. So zero gets mapped to this darkest uh, black color and our largest value, which was just over 100, gets mapped to this lighter shade. Just wanted to also point out that was a pandas data frame, but we could also use NumPy arrays. So here is a little simple NumPy array. And so we could pass this to the Seaborn heat map as well. So just a couple more notes on common practices with the Seaborn heat map. The first one is you can actually transpose your heat map pretty easily. So just in case you aren't familiar, if you'd like to transpose any kind of pandas data frame or a NumPy array, all you need to do is reference this .t property. So that will completely invert your matrix so that now cylinders represent the rows and origin is in the columns. So you can plot this as well using Seaborn's heat map. We're just passing in that origin cylinder matrix, but we've transposed everything. Another really common matrix to visualize with a heat map is the correlation matrix. So if you have a pandas data frame like this one, you can access these correlations just by using this dot core method. What we're doing here is taking all of our numeric features from the original data frame and checking the correlations between those features. So miles per gallon is perfectly correlated with miles per gallon and negatively correlated with cylinders. 
By the way, if you are familiar with correlations, this is the Pearson correlation, but you can actually switch this if you'd prefer. So this is a really common matrix to visualize with a heat map because we have so many different values. So let's go ahead and put that into our heat map. There we go. So now you'll see values that are positively correlated are getting mapped to this lighter shade and values that are negatively correlated are getting mapped to this darker shade. So one thing we're definitely going to talk about more in this video is color palette choices. So right now we have larger values getting mapped to this lighter color. Um, but if you do want to draw attention to that positive correlation, you might choose a different color palette for these data. So choosing an appropriate color palette is actually super important for building an effective heat map. It turns out that if I'm presented with both a lighter and a darker color, the human eye is more likely to be drawn toward that darker color first. In Seaborn, the default color palette actually maps larger values to lighter colors and smaller values to darker colors. If instead I'd like to highlight those larger values, I actually need a palette that's just the reverse. So let's take a look at the Seaborn code on how you can change that color palette and what color palette options you have. Seaborn offers 170 different color palettes, so you have many options when choosing the aesthetics of your heat map. The way to change the color palette of your heat map is to reference an argument called CMAP or color map. Now you'll just pass in the string that represents the palette you'd like to choose. So here I'm using a sequential palette. That just means that I have one color that varies from its lightest shade to its darkest shade. For other cases, it might be more appropriate to choose a diverging color palette. So here we're going to choose a palette that starts with red at one end and goes to blue on the other end. This choice might be more appropriate if you want to highlight both small values and large values, such as in this correlation map. You'll notice in this correlation heat map that my center point is not exactly at zero. If I'd like to change that and center my color map to be exactly a certain value, I can just reference the center argument. Now we have the center set to exactly white, and I'm judging the positive and negative correlations on equal footing. Another way to judge positive and negative correlations here is to actually specify what values will start and end my color map. So let's actually set our minimum value to be negative one and our positive value to be positive one. We'll see now that negative one, which is the lower bound for correlations, is mapping to this darkest red color, and positive one is mapping to this darkest blue color, which is the maximum value our correlations could be. So remember that the heat map is just a visual way to display a table of numbers. One really effective way to do this is to not only display those colors, but to also annotate those numbers directly on your heat map. Let's take a look at the Seaborn code that will allow you to do this. Adding annotations to your Seaborn heat map is actually pretty simple. All you need to do is access this argument called annote and switch that to true. That signals to Seaborn that you actually want it to annotate the values of every single square in your heat map. One thing that happens though that I often find is a little bit undesirable, the default behavior is actually specified in numbers of significant digits, so you'll end up with this scientific notation for some values. So you can actually switch the format of these annotations as well. So that's actually just with a property called format or FMT. And here we're just going to specify a string that lets Seaborn know exactly how many decimal places we would like. So I would actually not like any decimal places here. Um, I'm going to have a floating point number with no decimal places. That's what this means. So I end up with integers here. So I have 103 instead of that scientific notation. Of course, if I did want decimals, I could just switch this to, let's say, 0.1 which would let Seaborn know that I do want one decimal place. You can also style the annotations through this argument called annote keywords. So annote keywords. And this accepts a dictionary. So you can actually build up many, many different types of properties if you would like. So let's say you want to change the font size. And we'll increase that to 16. Now we see much larger annotations on that heat map. Or perhaps we would like to change this to be bold, that's font weight. Or we can even change the font family. 
These are really just any properties that you know about for styling text within matplotlib you can use here. You can, of course, change the color of these annotations as well with just referencing color. But I actually often choose not to do this because you can see what happens. Um, if I set the color to be all black, uh, I'm kind of losing out of some of these values, particularly in these really large values at my darkest part of my color map. So I often uh, choose not to do that because Seaborn is actually um, trying to figure out for you if a value should be written as black or white. So the heat map is a fairly straightforward visual that can display a lot of information, but you really have to get the styling right in order for your heat map to be effective. Let's take a look at some final advanced styling tips that will have you coding up your own heat maps like a pro. One way you can style your heat map is to put a little line between each of the rectangles. So you can do this by accessing this property called line width, and you'll just set this to a numerical value for however wide you'd like those lines to be. Now you'll see we have a little white line that separates every single rectangle. The default color here, of course, is white, but if you'd like to change that, you can with this property called line color. And that just switches the color in between. Now we've got this nice kind of retro feel for our heat map. Another common styling tip is to change the tick labels in your heat map. So right now we're using the correlation matrix from pandas. So this is actually a pandas data frame and these tick labels are pulled in from the data frame itself. But you can change these. If you would like to create your own list of labels, you can just pass that to x tick labels, it's labels. We actually have the same values on the y axis, so let's change that to y tick labels as well. Now you'll see we have these nice um, capitalized values for our tick labels, and those are coming from this list. So these properties, x tick labels and y tick labels, will actually accept a couple of different things. You can either pass your own list of values, or you can potentially turn these labels off by passing in a boolean value. Here I've passed in false, which signifies that I do not want x tick labels. My last styling tip here is about the size of those rectangles. So right now, uh, Seymour is actually styling those rectangles based on the overall figure size of your heat map. But you can specify if you would like each of those rectangles to actually be perfect squares. You can turn on this property called square equals true. And now you'll see no matter how many values you have for the y and x, you will end up with perfect squares throughout your heat map. So I hope you've enjoyed learning all about the Seaborn heat map. If you have any additional questions about the heat map or about Seaborn in general, feel free to leave me a comment below or check out another video in this Intro to Seaborn series. Thanks so much, and I will see you in the next one.